So good morning, everybody. And thank you. And, <laughs> and welcome to the session on plastics in North Carolina's waters. Uh, my name is Gloria Putnam. Obviously, I'm the moderator for today. Um, I'm based out of NC, I'm within North Carolina Sea Grant and based here out of um, NC State University. Uh, this is somewhat of an intentional session. Um, we have invited speakers um, to come talk to you about uh, plastics uh, research, uh, mostly in North Carolina, but um, also in some other, area, other areas. And um, I wanna let you know that we were actually sort of making history today. Um, I've been coming to North Carolina Water Resources Research Institute conferences for about 15 years now. And as far as I know, we have never had a session on plastics. So thanks for joining us. We were gonna do something in 2020, but a little thing called uh, COVID-19 sort of upstage us. Um, so I'm very glad to be here today, glad and, and very thankful for all of our speakers. Um, as you know, the plastics is becoming uh, a huge issue, uh, not just in our waterways, but in our lands and our bodies. Um, so this is something that's that's a global global concern. Um, so our speakers, we have two virtual speakers. We have one um, person that will be here, uh, actually in the room, and each speaker will have hopefully a little bit of time to answer some questions. But we also have about ten minutes at the end of the session, at, at end of the, all the presentations to ask questions, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, I participated online yesterday. There were very few questions that were submitted. Uh, so I just wanna remind everybody that you were learned a long time ago that there's no such thing as a stupid question or a bad question. So please do make sure that if you're online, go ahead and submit your questions. And if you're here, um, please participate because we have some great experts that are with us uh, joining us today. Um, so, our first speaker is actually joining us from the West, West Coast, Suzanne Brander. Um, I see you there on the screen. Very excited to have you here. She has agreed to uh, start out our session with a general introduction to plastics to sort of get us all on the same page. Plastics are a very complicated issue. Um, and I think it helps to understand the complexity before we uh, hear from some of the other uh, presenters. Uh, so it's early. Um, out on the West Coast, uh, and uh, we, she is going to give us an, well, that's a good storm we're having here. Um, so she's going to give us an introduction, and then she's going to uh, move into some of the biological implications of plastics. So uh, the sky is welcoming you, Suzanne, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, good, I, I heard that. And um, I also have a North Carolina connection. I used to be based at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and worked closely with one of the other speakers in the session today, um, Bonnie Monteleone. Um, so today, I, like, um, like she said, I'm going to be introducing sort of the global challenge. And then I'll be talking a bit about work that we've been doing at Oregon State University that is applicable to the East Coast and to North Carolina because the fish species that we've been using is, is native to, to North Carolina and to the East Coast as well as the Gulf Coast. Um, and so, again, coming to you from Oregon State University, but used to be based at UNCW, and just I'm going to introduce um, the session by um, reminding people, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with this, that plastics and microplastics are basically everywhere we look. I know it, it feels like every day a new study is coming out. I think the latest one is that microplastics have been detected in, in human blood, for example. But my talk will mainly focus on the environment. And we know microplastics are ubiquitous in the ocean, even at relatively remote sites. Global estimates for microplastics on the seafloor are currently 14 million tons. Most of the plastics are sinking to the sediments. Um, but the ocean, it turns out, is not just a sink for microplastics, but it's also a source. Um, aerial deposition has been documented globally as well. So the ocean has been receiving our plastics for years, and now it's kind of it's, it's spitting them back out at us in, in a way. Um, and there are other things that we're just starting con to consider, like, the, for example, the microplastics presence in sediments can also affect microbial communities. So kind of the more we dig into this problem, so to speak, the more, the more challenges we find. We're not going to run out of things to do. 
Um, and thinking about sources, they're also a bit more complex than we also think. We often think um, packaging is the biggest source. If you've ever ordered packages from Amazon, you know they come with ridiculous amounts of bubble wrap and, and unnecessary packaging, so that's a huge challenge. But textiles, which I think is something we maybe don't think as much about when it comes to plastic pollution, are the second biggest source. And really, we're, we're at a point where we need to kind of turn off the tap or at least stem the tide because we know that by 2030, which isn't very far away, annual plastics emissions are predicted to reach at least 20 million metric tons per year unless we make concerted changes to our plastics economy. And I'll talk a little bit later um, in my talk, my, the, the second talk in this session, about how we're, we're moving towards that globally. Um, and because those sources are so complex, microplastics as a contaminant suite are complex as well. So the microplastics that are shedding and breaking down from our macroplastics come from a huge number of categories, polymer types, including different additives. Um, the plastics are going to look different depending on what product they're breaking down from. And of course, we have different morphologies. Um, so plastics are going to range um, from anything from a fiber to a bundle. Sometimes they look like filaments or foams. Very rarely do you see a microsphere. It's usually something that's irregularly shaped and a little bit more challenging to characterize. And the reason for that is this breakdown process that's shown here. So microplastics pl that get into the environment, of course, weather, if you've ever had a beach chair left in your backyard, you know that UV radiation will break down that plastic, um, plasticizers that kind of help make that plastic more flexible tend to leach out. The plastic becomes brittle and it breaks off into smaller pieces. And that, of course, adds to the complexity. It um, makes it more mobile. Sometimes biofilms grow on those plastics and changes their density and where they're going to end up. And so there's this integration into natural organic matter, be they, um, be it biofilms or fish or zooplankton. And of course, you can't neglect the fact that there are thousands of different substances used in the manufacture of plastics. Um, at this point, about 10,000 different substances are estimated to be used. We lack the hazard data on most of these chemicals, um, and that's really due to you know, a, a shortage in funding and people on the ground to really evaluate um, every chemical that comes out on the market for toxicity. And there are hundreds of new chemicals coming out on the market each year. The challenge here is that those chemicals don't stay put. And so if you grab a piece of plastic, microplastic from the environment or find a piece of plastic inside a fish, it's not going to have the same chemical composition that it did when it was made because it has gone through all of these weathering and breakdown processes. And so often those chemicals have already leached out. And that's not to say that they aren't still impact in the environment, but it does add another level of complexity to studying microplastics because the chemicals that it originally started out with aren't necessarily there when you find it. And so this is a huge challenge. And many of these chemicals, such as plasticizers, um, we've all heard of bisphenol A, are endocrine disrupting compounds, meaning that they can mimic hormones that we make naturally. Our body can't necessarily tell the difference which is what I'm showing here in this somewhat overly complicated diagram of a cell and showing how um, endogenous hormones and endocrine disrupting compounds like some of these substances used in plastics can make their way into our cells, bind to receptors, kind of trick our cells into thinking they're an estrogen or um, an androgen like testosterone when, when they're not. And so this is a huge concern and it's almost become a study, um, kind of a separate subfield from the subfield of studying microplastics in, in biota. And as scientists um, as a group are trying to figure out how to kind of study them in concert when so much of this process is dictated by weathering and those chemicals leaching and going and going elsewhere. There are also issues with size. And so 
most of the study of microplastics has focused on chemicals that are, sorry, plastics, that are larger than, say, 50 to 100 microns in size. So the definition of a microplastic is anything under 5 millimeters in one diameter. But now we're realizing that we also need to consider the nanoscale. And nanoscale plastics or particles are smaller than one micron, so they can only really be visualized with a scanning electron microscope. But we know, predictions say, that there are, there are an order of magnitude more of these nanoplastics in the environment compared to microplastics because plastics don't really go away, they just continue to break down into smaller pieces. And some research um, that I collaborated on earlier last year shows that this, this is also a complex issue because nanoplastic behavior changes depending on the environment that those plastics are found in. And so in more saline environments, they tend to cluster together. And then you have a situation where maybe you've got nanoplastics that are turning into microplastics. And so that's something else we need to think about as well, that kind of how the abiotic factors in the aquatic environment and other environments influence the behavior of micro and nanoplastics. And of course, it, there's a lot of complexity here. And this was indicated by the sources graph that I showed earlier. But we're not just finding plastics, the things you would think like, oh, well, I, I often get questions. Oh, well, you're mostly finding um, those beads that they put in face wash, right? Not really, and those have been banned, at least in the US and Europe over the past few years. But mostly what we're finding are just really complex pieces of plastic like what you see here, which, which kind of looks like a piece of cellophane. And what scientists will do is use spectroscopy approaches to try to identify what those material types might be. They're not always what we expect, and they're not always just plastic. So this piece of, of cellophane looking sort of filament, we traced it back to the lining of a coffee cup. Um, and a lot of people don't think about this, but coffee cups are all lined with, um, with high density polyethylene, sometimes with uh, polylactic acid plastic, but there's plastic lining those cups to keep them from, from dissolving when you pour a hot liquid in there. And a lot of our samples just look like bundles of fibers, like something that's come from somebody's laundry. So really, on the whole, we know that systemic change is needed to stem this, to stem this tide of plastic, and that we, we can't easily go out into the environment and remove the microplastics once they're there. And so analyses done by groups like um, the Pew Institute, this was published back in 2020, have predicted what we would see in terms of business as usual, and this is only predicting out to 2040, which is, is only 18 years away at this point. And then looking at things like, well, what if we improve recycling? What if we reduce and substitute? What if we collect and dispose more effectively? And those all help us sort of level things out a bit. We still have a slight increase, you can see, especially with the recycling, which we're not very good at. But a system change scenario is the only approach that's really going to bring us down um, to a, a lower level of production than what we are currently seeing. And this is needed sooner rather than later, given, given the half-life of some of these plastics that we're, we're using on a daily basis. I'll wrap up just talking about some movements in that direction of systemic change. Uh, recent actions in the state of California, um, and this includes some working groups that I've been involved with, have um, made some steps towards systemic change, at least in California, and I think some of these actions may influence the rest of the country. They've generated a statewide microplastic strategy. They've announced a method for monitoring microplastics in drinking water. Um, all of this has been stimulated by state legislation that was passed at the end of 2018. And it really includes an approach that um, combines monitoring with risk assessment, with identification of sources and pathways of those plastics and aiming at source reduction where possible. Um, so new solutions, developing and evaluating pollution prevention um, and intervention strategies, which is, which is really exciting to see.
um, and they've come up with a definition of microplastics. It says here in drinking water, but that's the definition they're using um, more widely as well for microplastics in um, the marine and freshwater environment as well. So really encouraging to see this, um, and I think it aligns with global efforts that are happening um, elsewhere in the world, um, in uh, countries in Europe, for example. So I'm going to finish up the, the plastics introduction um, for now and give people time to switch between talks. Um, and then I'll, I'll go on to talk a bit more about biological impacts. We're clapping for you. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. I, I know people are out there. I can't see them, but. No. <laughs> Just let me know when I should start again. I think you can go ahead and start. Oh, OK, great. All right, so what do we know about biological impacts? And like I was saying earlier, the work I'll be talking about today is funded by the National Science Foundation here at Oregon State, and it's in collaboration with Western Washington University. But we're using a model organism, a fish species, the inland silverside, which is native to the East Coast and um, pretty ubiquitous in um, North Carolina estuaries, as I as I personally experienced when I was when I was a researcher there a few years back. And so what do we know about biological impacts of microplastics? Um, over the past few years, a lot of progress has been made in our understanding of what microplastics do once they're internalized by a fish. I say internalized because they can be ingested. They can also be inhaled and get entrapped in the gills, or they can be ingested, and then if they're small enough, can translocate to other tissues within, within the organism. Um, generally, what's being found is that the size and shape of particles is really important. Fibers appear to be more toxic, more data is needed, and it also seems that there's a correlation between increasing toxicity and um, smaller particle size. So as the particles get smaller, it makes sense they're more likely to translocate, to interact with, with cells, um, and can do things like cause oxidative stress. Another big issue for aquatic organisms, particularly smaller aquatic organisms, is food dilution. Um, if you think about it, a copepod is anywhere, depending on the species, is 0.2 to 17 millimeters long. If it ingests a microfiber that is three millimeters long, that's a pretty considerable space that that fiber is taking up considering the small size of the organism. And so effects on growth are one of the most common effects observed in, um, in aquatic organisms across the board. And the challenge scientists are facing right now is that most of the data are on commercially available microplastic particles rather than the realistic microparticles like the ones I showed a few slides back, the ones that we're actually finding in, in our samples. So to summarize kind of across taxonomic groups, we are beginning to converge on some common responses. So the growth impacts, oxidative stress, where an organism is producing um, things like hydrogen peroxide in its cells, which is an indicator that the cells are stressed. Those reactive oxygen species that are produced can then damage cell membranes, can damage tissues. Um, and then of course, some studies see no effect or impacts are only observed at high concentrations. And so we're still really trying to get at what the risk is. But what we do see is that across algae, invertebrates, fin fish, um, we have fewer data in megafauna, but those are coming out, that this, these common responses where you see reactive oxygen species and cellular stress accompanied by usually decreases in growth. Sometimes in algae you see an increase and then a decrease. Um, there's, there's, a huge, there's, a, there's a huge challenge and we're starting to see that those responses are, are, are in agreement in a lot of cases. But there are so many microplastics and there's only so much time. 
Um, and so um, our lab and a lot of labs globally are starting to resort to high throughput testing. Um, and in our case, we use an adapted fish early life stage toxicity test and are using that testing in a couple of different fish species. My lab is focused on inland silversides. My colleague who is part of the same grant is focused on zebrafish. And we're trying to evaluate a lot of different plastic types, sizes, shapes, to really get at what that comparative um, toxicity is. And as you can see here, this is a just showing you one of those high throughput assays and the, the larval fish um, that we're evaluating responses in. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. So where do we get these microplastics we're using from? Um, well, luckily I collaborate with the, the Harper Lab and they are, um, they are half time in the engineering department at Oregon State University. And so they have the capability of producing particles on site. And so they can take a cup or a straw or a tire and mill that down to specific sizes using filtration processes um, and other instrumentation. And so we're able to generate tire wear particles and polyethylene terephthalate particles. This would be from a water bottle. Polypropylene particles or polylactic acid. This is a bioplastic that's being substitute, used as a substitute in lots of different product types. So these are just a few examples of milled plastics, and these are being produced by the Harper Lab at the micro and the nano scale. So all of these, met, these um, images were taken on a scanning electron microscope, um, and really just aiming to mimic the complexity of micro and nanoparticles in the environment. As you can see, these aren't spheres, and that makes a big difference because the more kind of nooks and crannies and crevices a particle has, the more surface area it has. And so that changes lots of things. It can change its surface charge. It can change how it interacts with components in the cell. It can change how much of um, absorbed pollutant can exist on the surface of that particle. And so it's, it's, it's a huge issue that, that needs more attention. And we're trying to at least scratch the surface, so to speak. And so for my group uh, in studies in the inland silver side, which again is, is native to the East Coast and North Carolina, it's been introduced to the West Coast, so it's, it's kind of everywhere at this point, which makes it a good model fish to study microplastic responses in. We're looking at three main types of responses. We're looking at behavior, which is really important ecologically. If you think about if an organism's behavior is changing, it's gonna change how it obtains food, it's going to change um, whether it's susceptible to predation. We're looking at growth, which is a big um, challenge when it comes to microplastics across taxonomic groups. And we're also looking at biochemical changes. And I'm going to present some data on behavioral responses and growth, um, the biochemical work, so looking at things like gene expression and reactive oxygen species production that is still um, underway. And so we use an instrument called a Noldus Ethovision to record behavior after we've exposed organisms to plastics or to some other environmental stressor. And so this is just a picture of what the screen would look like in our instrument that we, we basically place the fish in there after, after they've been exposed. Um, things like distance moved, which part of the well, which zone they're spending more time in, how they're turning, how they're meandering, and how their turn angle might change depending on stress or exposure. And all of these seem like really subtle things, but they can add up to big um, big changes in how the organism interacts with this environment, and then of course influence those things I mentioned earlier, like predator, um, predator avoidance or ability to obtain food on your own, ability to hunt for your own prey, for example. So a lot of our focus in terms of thinking about effects on behavior and growth in the inland silver side, um, some of this work is being done in zebrafish too, and we'll talk about that today, um, are on tire particles. Tire particles are, in a, in a way, they're new on the scene in terms of microplastics concerns, but they're not really new. Just like plastic pollution isn't really new, it's been with us since the, at least the 1950s or 60s, 
tire particles have been released since we've had cars, but we're finally realizing this is a huge issue. Um, global annual emissions are estimated to be over 6 million tons at this point, with brake wear adding more on top of that. A uh, recent study out of the San Francisco Bay showed that fibers and black rubbery fragments presumed to be tire particles were the most frequent morphologies found in stormwater samples. And so they're starting to install rain gardens in cities like Oakland to capture those particles before they get into the environment. But we know, as you can see from this image, that this is a huge issue for aquatic ecosystems. Um, that has also been studied off the coast of South Carolina in Charleston. There are, there are several new studies out on tire particles there as well. And so we decided to investigate what tire particles might be doing to, to larval fish. And so fish were exposed um, basically right after hatching um, to three different concentrations of tire particles at both the micro and nano size fraction. And we did this across several salinities. The reason for that is that, of course, we know fish like the silver side are urohaline, and so they're shifting between different salinities on a daily basis as the tide comes in and out. Um, and we know that salinity influences the density of particles, and so that's going to change where they exist in the water column, whether they are seen as a food source or maybe they sink out too quickly to be seen as a food source. And we looked at behavior and growth and just showing some this is a scanning electron image. This is an image of the many, many beakers um, um, students and, and lab staff loaded. Um, and then um, just some close-ups of the fish um, during behavioral assays. So we confirmed ingestion of these particles. And you can see this is an image of another species we're using that I'm not going to talk about as much today for lack of time. But this is a mycid shrimp which is another estuarine organism that's commonly found in coastal areas in really globally, but in North America. Um, and this is Menidia berylina. You can see we confirmed the presence of tire particles in their guts. And that we did interestingly see that both of them were ingesting particles differentially depending on the salinity. And, and both of them ingested the most particles at 15 parts per thousand salinity which may have been due to a density factor at that salinity. And showing all of the, um, the folks involved in this study below, and this is work that was just published in the journal Chemosphere a few weeks ago. We also looked at behavior, and just to orient you to these plots, these are radar plots. The center of the plot is zero. All of these behavioral responses have been normalized to the control. The control is in red. And what you're seeing are different behaviors that we measured, like where in the beaker the fish was occupying or take, spending the most time, things like turn angle, distance moved, freezing behavior, as well as um, overall movement. And you can see that in most cases, tire particles across different salinities were most significantly affecting where in the beaker those fish were spending the most time. That is an indicator of anxiety in fish. If they're spending more time along the perimeter of the beaker, that indicates um, anxiety. If they're spending more time in the center of the beaker, that's an indication of boldness. And changes in those sort of anxiety-related behaviors can really influence how that fish interacts with its surroundings in the wild. So this was with the micro tire particles. And then similarly with the nano tire particles, we also saw that this in-zone duration was really the most influenced behavioral endpoint. We're also seeing some effects on things like turn angle and freezing duration as well. And you can see that for the size differences, we saw more effects on the freezing duration or freezing frequency than we did um, with the micro compared to the nano. And I'm seeing that I have seven minutes left, thank you. Um, so thinking about growth, we saw effects on growth as well. So as you increase the concentration of tire particles, you saw decreased growth. And this isn't too surprising, but what is surprising is that it happened over a matter of about four days, which wasn't very long. And we think it's because the fish were exposed at a very early life stage. So we're really sensitive to even small numbers of particles in the gut. 
Um, and we saw that at nano, this effect was more pronounced at higher salinities, probably because of that agglomeration I talked about earlier. We've also done exposures to microfibers, and I won't belabor the details here, but um, my postdoc, Dr. Samreen Siddiqui, uh, invented a way to make reliably sized microfibers using a coffee grinder, which has been fantastic. Um, and so she looked at growth and compared cotton, polyester, and polypropylene microfibers and found that cotton fibers didn't really affect growth, which is good, but polyester and polypropylene did. As you increase the concentration, you saw more of an effect on growth um, than you did at lower concentrations with those synthetic fibers. We've also done some weathering, um, and this is where under laboratory conditions, we take test materials and irradiate them under UV light and sort of rotate them in seawater to mimic what would be happening in the environment as best we can. Um, and we've also seen that there is a difference in response between new particles and weathered particles. And the weathered particles tend to cause less of a response than the new particles do. We think that's because the chemicals that are contained within these microplastics are leaching out just like they do in the environment and really emphasizes the importance of making your particles as realistic as possible because if your particles are new, they're not necessarily representing what fish are going to be interacting with in the environment. And this was a tire and polyester mixture. And we're also at the point of trying to compare responses across lots of different plastic types. So as you, as you can see down here, here we have things like pet plastic, polypropylene, polypropylene microfibers, PLA. Here we have tire particles and cotton. But looking across behavioral responses, plastic types and plastic sizes, and this is new work that we're still, it's preliminary, but we're trying to find a way to compare between all of these different exposures to get at which plastic types we should be most concerned about. And we're doing this in silver sides, and we're also comparing responses in silver sides to responses in zebrafish, which is a freshwater fish species. So for summary and implications, we saw altered behavior for basically all particle types we, we tested. And changing behavior makes an organism more easily prone to predation, and it's a, it's a sign of, of general stress. Growth was reduced for tire particles and synthetic fibers and some of the other synthetic polymers that we tested that I didn't go over. We didn't see that same response for cotton. We think that fish are potentially better able to break down the cellulose in comparison to, to the synthetic particles, but um, that needs to be further investigated. And we think the sensitivity is due to their early life stage um, and sometimes particle exposure differs depending on the salinity at which, at which those fish are exposed. And it turns out that weathering matters. And other, other labs have, have seen that and, and have, have published on that recently. So I'm not going to get too much into the set, assessing risk part of this because I'm a little bit short on time. But just to um, quickly talk about some of the work that's been going on in California, uh, in California, there are several agencies really trying to take the lead on taking the data that we do have, which is shown here. This is a species sensitivity distribution. I'm showing data that's available from lots of different aquatic organisms here. And they're looking at things like food dilution, which influences growth and tissue translocation, and trying to get at what those thresholds, toxicity thresholds might be. And this is still really in progress. There will be a paper out later this year. But they're trying to derive microplastics thresholds for ambient waters, not just for the state of California, but the data set they're using is a global data set. So this will be of relevance to other parts of the world as well. But just really trying to get at you know, how concerned should we be? Are we down here at investigative monitoring? Or are we, are we at the point where we need to consider source control measures? And thresholds are going to change as additional data are included. Like I said earlier, a lot of the data we have are on these commercially produced particles that are not necessarily realistic or reflective of what we find in the environment. So more data is needed. I think every scientist ends their talk by saying that. We're starting to think about this from a more global perspective, which is really encouraging. There's a binding global treaty promised by 2024. Um, 
there are things you can do, but really actions that are being taken like the state of like the state of California is doing are the way to kind of drive progress forward a little bit faster. Um, and I'll finish up there with um, some links to our website and our social media handles if you'd like more information or to follow us on Twitter or Instagram. And thank you so much for your time. And we're clapping. Um, I think we'll take one question while Jack is uh, moving up front to get set up. I'll see if I can see these questions here on the Q and A um, that were sent that, that have been submitted. Uh, Denise is asking, "What's the best way right now to dispose of plastic for individuals?" Of plastic, what? Plastics for individuals. Plastics for individuals. That's a really good question. In terms of our recycling capabilities, they're, they're not great. And, and something that has been a big challenge over the past couple of years is that um, we used to be shipping a lot of our plastics over to Asia, um, and those countries are no longer taking those plastics because they can't, be, um, they can't easily be recycled. I would say the best approach is to try to use less to begin with. And if you are purchasing plastics, to purchase the ones like number the ones that have ones and twos on the bottom, think that can be more easily recycled. Um, and then something that we do here and others that I know do is they put um, filters on their washing machines, for example, to try to capture fibers as they're coming off clothing, and then you can just dump those in in the trash rather than having them go out to. Um, out in the wastewater treatment effluent. So there are there are things we can do. You can wash your clothes less. Um, but really, I think a lot of the focus, sorry, this keeps switching back. A lot of the focus is on source reduction um, since we don't necessarily have, um, have great options when it comes to recycling or disposal. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, we actually have three minutes left in this session. If there are any questions um, from the audience, I'll take those first. We do have a question from somebody online. Go on. Yeah. Right. Thanks, this may be more for uh, Jack. I was just curious um, in the, the survey, if you got this to this granular level of analysis to see whether um, there was a difference in the types of plastics that you found in the more urban subwatersheds or, or streams that you were surveying versus some of the less urban. We haven't got to that point yet where we've been doing that analysis, but that's part, part of the plan to do that. That's good. They're not quite there yet. That's what Jack said in his analysis. Frank, did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, we did have a question online um, asking if uh, municipalities were required to um, their, with their stormwater programs, if they're required to monitor and quantify the trash that's going down in the streams. And um, uh, Suzanne, I see you shaking your head. I don't know where Bonnie is. Um, I'm sure she's there, but um, do you wanna respond to that, Suzanne? Sure, I'll let Bonnie respond first, specific to North Carolina, but I can follow up. Um, I don't know specifically. I will tell you that with the work we're doing with NC State, uh, one of the things we weren't finding as much of were fibers. And so what we did was have a meeting with our local municipality asking them if they were doing anything different um, as far as uh, what they were releasing into the environment. And we were very impressed with the level of um, commitment to reduce the amount of fibers being released from our wastewater treatment plants. Uh, the irony was they use a type of polymer to coagulate the fibers and small plastic particles in order to, for them to, to grab them and remove them and put them in the landfill. 
So uh, very interesting. But as far as uh, the other side of it, I don't know the answer. So go ahead, Susan, take it from there. Sure. Yeah. Um, at this point, microplastics and plastics in general are not regulated under the Clean Water Act or any kind of federal legislation. I think there's movement towards that in that direction with things like the proposed Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. But as far as I know, in the U.S., the state of California is the only state sort of really moving in that direction to regulate plastics and to and to reduce loading at this time. Uh, yeah, there's only a few uh, rivers and streams around the country that have some kind of debris standard because of a m lot of garbage, but it's not part of the MPDS stormwater program, which is what I would like to see it because stormwater prog programs also have to do education. And we know that's a piece of it, right? So what we're hoping is to get to where we're going to come up with a good maybe sampling protocol and even suggested standards that could be used for micro and macro. Um, I, that's one of our goals with the NC State project that we're doing, not just to tell people it's out there, please don't throw it out, but there needs to be something more than just educating citizens. It's got to be bigger than that. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's only one river in the country that might have a total maximum daily load for the amount of uh, trash that's being entered into it. I think it's in California. So we are actually at our time. Um, so another thank you for our speakers that are joining us. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Yep. Good stuff.